facing a situation that's similar to um, 2013 in, in one respect, and that last time uh, UC also wanted to impose a, or you know, impose a opt-out version for a pension. And one of the major things that was able to stop that is after all the negotiations, after all the petitioning, after all the um, bargaining conferences and all the organizing, we went on strike. And we had to go on strike. Otherwise, we wouldn't have gotten what we got. And what we got was basically we were able to um, avoid the two-tier system that they uh, wanted to create for us, and um, we were able to keep our pension. And I really feel like it's really necessary to show that the people that made it possible, or some, some of the group of people that made it possible were workers at UC. And in particular, I want to point out that um, the clinical lab scientists, Janie Frank and Sonia Moscardon, were two of the uh, main organizers of the clinical lab scientists, and they were able to bring out almost all of the clinical lab scientists for the strike. And that was very important because without clinical lab scientists, as you know, many of us have very important positions at, at the hospital, but the clinical lab scientists realized the importance of striking for their patients. Because at the rate things are going now, where UC is only offering a pittance to all of the three un unions, um, and at the same time is trying to undermine our pension, it's really important that we recognize the roles that people have played before and the victories that were won as a, re as a result of the organizing and a as a result of, of participating in the strike and participating in the union. So I would like to give a shout out to Jamie, Frank, and Sonia. And I'm going to give Sonia the opportunity to speak um, to present Matthew. Good noon to one and all. Um, first of all, I want to exercise my attitude of gratitude for having you all here. Thank you for being here. And uh, I was given the honor to introduce Matthew. Matthew Cunningham Cook is UPT CWA's public sector researcher as both an investigative journalist and researcher. He covered the pension retirement crisis for six years. His work on pension has been honored by the Society of American Business Editors and Writers. He served on the steering committee of the Trustee Leadership Forum for Retirement Security and on the board of the National Public Pension Coalition as APTI CWA's representative. Let's welcome Matthew. Thank you uh, so much uh, for having me here. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're going to get started. Uh, the, yeah, uh, so there's a sign-in sheet that's going to be passed around. Uh, just to start, uh, we're, we're in a moment uh, politically where uh, I, I'm here because the university has adopted a, a position in bargaining that's really uh, untenable when it comes to preserving uh, pensions, as you see, uh, preserving retirement security. Um, the proposal to allow an opt-out uh, to the defined benefit plan to give people the choice of a plan uh, for a 401k style plan that will give people about half of what they would in retirement uh, from a traditional defined benefit plan. It's not a real choice. It's about preying on uh, uh, people's lack of experience with traditional defined benefit pensions uh, to exploit uh, that lack, lack of knowledge, uh, so as to divide working people at the University of California and ultimately to get rid of pensions altogether. Um, and that's part of a, a nationwide effort, uh, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. So I just wanted to uh, start with uh, some vocab. Uh, so a defined benefit pension is a, a pension plan with a guaranteed benefit for one's retirement. 
It's calculated by what's called a multiple. Uh, so it's years of service times final average salary times your age, some type of combination of that. Uh, and uh, that determines your benefit. And like I said, uh, for your typical UC worker who works about 20 years, uh, they'll get about half of their final average salary in retirement. A defined contribution plan is a 401k or 403b style plan. There's no guaranteed payout on retirement. Uh, DC plans have high fees, uh, and they're subject to the exigencies of the stock market. So if you retired in 2009, and your only source of retirement was your 401k, you uh, had lost about half of what your 401k value, typical, the typical worker lost about half of their 401k value uh, from 2007 to 2009. So it's not a real retirement. It's, it's about outsourcing what should be a social good, which is the right to enjoy your retirement and not have to fear in poverty to uh, the market. Uh, so um, an actuary uh, is uh, somebody who makes estimates uh, that form the basis for how much needs to be put into a traditional defined benefit pension plan. I'm just going over that now because you hear uh, that word bandied about a lot. And then an actuarially required contribution is the annual contribution to a public plan uh, from the employer-employee contributions. So in the aftermath of the financial crisis, uh, every single state uh, passed uh, laws that attacked uh, public worker pensions in one way or another. Uh, and most of what you saw were higher employee contributions, uh, reduced cost of living adjustments, uh, higher retirement ages, uh, new pension tiers for new employees, so lower benefits for younger workers, uh, and efforts to shift public employees into 401ks uh, or, or DC plans. Um, and the attack really c coincided with mass media hysteria over the scale of long-term pension liability. Like, oh, you know, the plans are now, due to the stock market crash, the plans are now underfunded. Uh, we have, you know, we owe tens of billions of dollars on our, our, our pensions, and we can't afford them anymore. They're bankrupting us, and so we need to cut benefits. We need to move people into traditional defined, into out of traditional defined benefit pensions into defined contribution plans, into 401ks. And one person in particular, uh, uh, really has defined this shift in our political economy. Uh, so the John Arnold, the Laura and John Arnold Foundation has, has spent tens of millions of dollars attacking traditional defined benefit pensions. Arnold was the head of the trading desk at Enron uh, that led to spikes in California energy prices. Uh, the, there's a famous email uh, from the Enron crisis where uh, a trader is talking about how they want to evict grandma from their house due to uh, insane spikes in energy prices. That trader was working directly under Arnold's supervision. Uh, he was able to escape without prosecution, um, luckily for him. He then headed the hedge fund, and he retired uh, in 2012 at 38 uh, with his billions of dollars and ill-gotten gains, and uh, he started his uh, Lauren John Arnold Foundation. And he started it uh, after having read a book by a, a right-wing loon that was uh, about, uh, uh, basically about how public sector unions are bankrupting America, how they are uh, 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 inimical to the interests of the public, uh, and he decided that he needed to fight against it. And he's, he was smarter than, you know, uh, it, he was correct in his analysis that a very effective way to go after the power of public sector unions is to go after our defined benefit pensions. Because that is, if you look at the salaries of, the, of public sector employees across the country, they are significantly lower than their private sector counterparts. And that's true of UC. If you do a salary comparison for almost every job title, looking at UC versus Kaiser, uh, you see Kaiser paying significantly better salary. The difference is the defined benefit pension plan. It's, the, it's what guarantees you that you'll be able to enjoy your retirement, that you won't be subject to a stock market crash destroying your retirement and you needing to work into your 70s. That is what 
defines working in the public sector as opposed to the private sector. Uh, and so he's correct that if he forces all of us into defined contribution plans, we'll start seeing significantly higher turnover at places like UCSF throughout the UC system. It'll undermine our steward structures. It'll undermine our ability to have a functioning union. It'll undermine our ability to strike. It'll eliminate the institutional knowledge that we have. It will hurt patients and patient care. Uh, and uh, so he's savvy. Uh, initially, he kind of pursued the, the Koch brothers' route of a direct frontal assault against us. And he worked closely with folks like San Jose Mayor Chuck Reed to attack uh, pensions there. Uh, what he quickly found is that despite some significant successes in places like Detroit, uh, on the whole, his campaign failed. The courts struck down almost every piece of legislation that he was able to successfully get passed uh, and uh, that w cut pension benefits for current retirees or current employees. Uh, and uh, so he shifted and he became smarter. And he now funds Pew, Brookings, the Urban, Urban Institute, these well-regarded mainstream think tanks and he has used these think tanks to really spread the idea that the number one threat to America are the unfunded liabilities of public pension plans. Uh, and so w when, when UC is demanding that we allow an opt-out to our DB pension, it's, it's really worth recalling that the Arnold Foundation uh, has delivered $14 million to, in grants to UC during the full time's tenure. Uh, while the Arnold Foundation funds other things besides pension reform, it's clear uh, that it is an extremely high priority for Arnold uh, to uh, uh, undermine pensions. And, you know, it's funny, I just found out yesterday, yesterday I just got a, a public records request back um, asking for uh, President Napolitano's schedule uh, for the first six months of this year. And what, what I found is, uh, a, that she met with Senator Glazer, uh, who sponsored uh, the bill to undermine CalPERS, a week after uh, he introduced his legislation. And so it's clear that there's a coordinated attack on pensions in California, uh, uh, and that folks at the elite levels of the university are working closely with other conservative politicians to advance attacks on our pension system. So it's concerted. It's real, uh, and the unifying person, in my opinion, is, is John Arnold. Um, Chuck Reed has been influential through all of this as well. He, he works for the Arnold Foundation now. Um, so it, the opt-out, you know, it's not really creating an entire, the savings choice plan, it's not creating an entirely new retirement option necessarily because Many of you, I'm guessing, already contribute to a 403B plan. Uh, how many folks contribute to a 403B plan? Yeah, well, almost everybody. Um, so, uh, so it's worth interrogating what exactly is happening with the 403B plan. So, uh, and what's happening at UC isn't exactly unique. Nationwide, universities across the country have settled for tens of billions of dollars. Uh, about high fees in their DC plans uh, and uh, forcing workers into high fee options. Uh, and so uh, at UC, though, there's uh, the fourth review plan, the record keeper is Fidelity. Most of the underlying funds are managed by Fidelity. And all the in education about the four B, three B plans are outsourced to Fidelity. UC pays Fidelity $900,000 a year. Uh, to have Fidelity lead these investor education workshops. Uh, but Fidelity is not free of conflict of interest. Fidelity has an interest in, in getting more fees out of people. So this is the universe of funds that are available in the 43B portfolio. And if you look at, at it, there's actually some pretty significant differences, as you can see, between the different plans. So, uh, I'm going to raise my voice. But, uh, so the, the bond fund here is the only 
low risk option, let's be clear. The rest of them are like the stock market. They all have more or less the same amount of risk. And yet there's really significant differences in the amount of fees that you're actually paying. And even greater, well not actually, and, and also significant differences in the performance. So international stocks, for example, foreign stocks in Europe, South Africa, Brazil, Mexico, they're even higher risk than the US stock market right here. Yet the performance is less than 20% over 10 years of, of traditional US stocks, which is historically Americans have only invested in American stocks. Warren Buffett says you shouldn't invest in foreign stocks uh, in part because of risk uh, and also because of the fact that American companies consistently outperform their foreign peers. And then there's also significant differences. In, so if you invested you know, $10,000 10 years ago exclusively in the international equity uh, index fund, you'd have uh, $11,800 as opposed to uh, in the domestic stock fund, you'd have over $20,000. So that's a really significant difference that people are eating the cost of. Uh, and yet the university is forcing more and more portions of your 43B into international stocks, into emerging markets, into this diversified international stock fund. And you also look at the fees. So, you know, it lo looks like the fees are actually kind of low here, right? You know, with the, this uh, diversified international fund or the emerging markets equity fund. This is actually, you know, over here for the emerging markets, this is about 20,000% higher fees for the emerging market equity fund than for the domestic small, small cap equity fund. So a really significant difference in the amount of fees that you're paying uh, for performance that's, you know, that's crap. That's just absolute crap. Uh, and, uh, and also higher risk. So, uh, so why exactly is this happening? Well, <laughs> um, yeah, just to, uh, yeah, these are the low performers. <laughs> so, uh, and then this is, you know, so then almost every, go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, and so this, so almost everybody has recommended that they invest in pathway funds, which are uh, 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 designed by the UCCIO in conjunction with Fidelity. Uh, and so here you look, it's, you know, you have 30%, you have 30% of the portfolio in emerging markets and international equities, mm -hmm. despite the fact that the performance is awful compared to traditional U.S. stocks. So you, you see you have more money in international stocks than you, with performance that looks like this than, than in the entire U.S. stock market fund. Uh, so, or it's about, yeah, 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 that's about the same. Uh, and, and let's be clear, this is wildly divergent with historical trends Americans mostly didn't invest in foreign stocks until about 15, 20 years ago. And again, it has real consequences for how much money is in your 403B account. So when the university is like, oh, you know, well, we know best. <laughs> you know, the savings choice is just about giving you an option. Really, it's giving you an option to pursue higher risk for, and it's outsourced to you. So when the university, and we're about to go into this, but when the university goes, and it's bad in the defined benefit plan. When they go in, into higher risk options in the defined benefit plan, they're the ones who are eating the cost, typically. You know, they have to make higher contributions. When there are employee contributions more or less stay the same year after year, theirs fluctuate depending on, on the performance of the market. Uh, whereas when it's you, you have no choice. It's, you know, you're forced into this fund that's going to cost you thousands and thousands of dollars and you have no recourse, you know, as opposed to the traditional DB plan where it's the multiplier that de determines your benefit, not the stock market. So you see as, you know, it's, uh, and we're going to get into this more a little bit later, but, you know, the, the, the main advantage to the opt-out is that it, it undermines the political basis for pensions. 
And you know, as I said before, you know, the Arnold Foundation has been dealt a, 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 a series of stinging legal defeats in terms of undermining our pensions. But the one, there are several areas where our, so in terms of, and I said this yesterday, but in terms of your benefit when you retire, that it's highly unlikely under any circumstances that it will go down. The greater question is what will happen to your cost of living adjustments? Those have, the courts have consistently undermined the legal basis for cost of living adjustments. So if you retire when you're 62 and you live till you're 102, that's you know uh, an over 50% cut to your pension over 40 years. Uh, you know you're eating a 3% cut year after year after year after year after year. Uh, and, and then the other piece is that there's nothing stopping them from making current employees pay more into the pension uh, to, to get the same benefit. So that they might just say, well, we need you to double your employee contributions. If you're 53, you've been paying into the pension for 20 years, you know, but to get the pension that you expected, you now have to pay a much larger portion of your salary. And so those are real political risks facing UPD members, facing UC workers as a whole. The opt-out undermines the political coalition to defend our pensions by pushing you, new, new workers who will overwhelmingly be the people who choose the savings choice plan. Uh, it means that you'll have a two-tier retirement system. The political basis for unity in Sacramento to defend our pensions is undermined. The power of unions is weakened. Uh, and your pension becomes at risk. Your cost of living adjustments become at risk. So, uh, at the same time, they're, they're pushing us into investment options that shortchange our 403 Bs and would shortchange our entire pension if opt-out is implemented. There's no way that the university doesn't know about the long-term poor performance of international stocks. The CEO, Backer, is a very sophisticated man. There's no way he doesn't, you know, have, have this right on his desk seeing this type of performance. There's no way he doesn't know that international stocks are higher risk and get you lower returns for higher fees, and yet he still includes them in the pathway funds. He still includes them in the international equity, uh, in the uh, gamut of options available to retirees. I called the lawyer uh, who's been suing you know, universities around the country for these types of behavior, and he said, you know, I'd love to sue UC, but it has sovereign immunity under the, UC, under the California State Constitution. So uh, he's like, I'd love to, but you know, that is not going to happen. <laughs> uh, so and as far as I understand, only a few other, like Michigan, I think is the only one, but anybody can correct me, that uh, has uh, sovereign immunity explicitly laid out in the state constitution. So, uh, and even CSU, I believe, does not have uh, sovereign immunity in its constitution, um, in the state constitution. Um, so, uh, you know, it, what we're seeing, the fastest growing demographic segment of people in poverty are elders in America. And that's because of the, the decline of defined benefit pensions. When 401ks were introduced in 1979, they were crafted as a supplement for managers. They were not crafted to be a real retirement option for people. But what you see now is in the private sector, pensions have been almost entirely eliminated. Uh, CWA is, uh, you know, represents both public and private sector. The public sector is about a third of CWA. Private sector is about two thirds. In the private sector, if you're a new employee hired in any CWA shop, except for a tiny few, you don't have a pension anymore. Uh, and that's because of a coordinated nationwide assault on private sector pensions. Fortunately, uh, it's much harder to go after public sector pensions for a great deal of reasons. And so in the public sector, all but one of CWA's 200 contracts in the, in the public sector, you will have a pension. So it's also important in, in liberal California, you know, and I'm from liberal Vermont where you see the same type of uh, foolishness from the elites there, but uh, you know, uh, you see uh, really uh, a historic attack on public sector pensions coming from democratic politicians uh, uh, that you don't see in places like 
Texas, you don't see it in places like Florida. Really, Napolitano is at the vanguard of efforts to get rid of defined benefit pensions altogether. So, uh, uh, but it, you know, it benefits some people in particular. You know, I mean, in terms of the, if you make six hundred thousand dollars a year, uh, you're probably uh, not going to be here very long. You know, you're usually a crony of, you know, of uh, a chancellor or a president, and uh, you're going to, you're plotting your next career move after, you know, and if you, it's, it's, you see it very, you know, Yudov had his own set of cronies who were here, they left when the Politano came in, and the Politano has their own set of cronies who make, you know, five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars a year, they're not going to be here uh, after um, uh, she leaves. Uh, and so, for most of them, they're not going to be here the five years that it takes to vest into the defined benefit plan. So, <laughs> for them, they have a real vested interest in creating uh, a defined contribution plan that uh, has the same level of cost to the university as the defined benefit plan. So that's, that's another kind of point with, with savings choice, is it doesn't save the university any money. Uh, but uh, what it does is, due to the fact that DC options uh, do not have the same uh, pooling advantages that defined benefit plans do, the average retirement will be about half of what a traditional defined benefit plan will offer. But again, if you're only here for three or four years, you really want that DC plan, and that's what's motivating uh, this uh, uh, attack by Napolitano. Uh, so yeah, as I said, you know, even though savings choice costs you see uh, and the employees the same, the same employer and employee contributions, uh, it'll provide about half the retirement. So what you have is is that UC and Fidelity will pressure workers into the DC plan because of its portability. That's the pitch. You know, that you might not be here very long, but once workers retire with half of the income that they would have received from the DV plan, there's nothing they can do. Uh, there are no cost savings to UC, so it's an ideological goal. They want to weaken UC's unions to take their pound of flesh. And my theory is that a big portion of this is, is anger over the audits uh, and their findings of mass malfeasance in UCOP. So, you know, last November, they found out that Napolitano was squirreling away $175 million. Zero oversight from the public. It was UC's unions that got the audit to happen. And so this is a way of getting their revenge. And the less power that the labor movement has at UC, the less oversight and accountability there is, the less uh, public services the university is able to provide in a comprehensive way, in a way that is responsive to the public as opposed to responsive to the interests of powerful billionaires. Uh, so, you know, we shouldn't forget uh, conflicts of interest either. So, the chair of the Regents uh, heads the lobbying department of uh, Manet, Phillips, and Phillips. Uh, the governor's sister works under him as a partner at Manet as well. Uh, and he's been on the UC board since 2009. Fidelity's only lobbyist in Sacramento for 16 years was Manet. <laughs> uh, the current lobbyist now is headed by a former Manet partner. Manet's received over $2 million in fees from Fidelity. Who benefits the most? from savings choice, fidelity. They'll get access to billions of dollars more in retirement assets to extract significant, to extract fees like these two right here from. That's the advantage there for fidelity. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I want to switch back to the traditional defined benefit plan because that's the other piece too, is that, you know, in terms of what the governor's initial, because a big part of this initial push came from the governor who said, you know, I want the university to do a study about doing a, you know, a defined contribution plan because, you know, there's these unfunded liabilities that are too onerous. So let's be clear, when they say, oh, you know, UC has this, you know, 20, 30 billion dollar unfunded liability, they can be paid off over 30 or 40 years. Only one public pension fund in the history of this country has ever run out of money. Pritchard, Alabama's pension fund. It's a town of 8,000 people. There was mass malfeasance and corruption. No other public pension fund has ever run out of money. No state has ever gone bankrupt. 
Uh, no state has ever defaulted on, their, on any kind of debt, much less pension debt. Uh, and unlike companies, states and cities have a tax base. They have a permanent revenue stream. Uh, uh, so there's General Electric, Verizon, AT&T, you know, who knows? They could eventually go out of business. It's not going to happen with the state of California. It's never going to happen. There's a 0% possibility for the, that the state of California would ever go out of business. It's their obligation. They have a constitutional obligation under the contracts clause to provide the benefits that they negotiated, that you paid into. So this idea that they're going to run out of money, that's political. That's not financial. Um, and then also, there's been some really substantial changes to the accounting rules here. So uh, uh, the, government, the Governmental Accounting Standards Board has uh, uh, formulated a series of new recommendations uh, uh, that have really significantly inf inflated the unfunded uh, liabilities of public pension plans. But despite its name, GASB is not a governmental body. It's controlled by private sector interests in the accounting industry. Uh, who have a vested interest in undermining uh, public pension funds because of the same reason why the Arnolds don't like them. There's a massive international campaign against the right of trade unionists to organize. There's a massive campaign by the 1% to undermine labor unions. This is what Janice V. asked me is about. This is what every single attack on collective bargaining that we've seen is about, is that they want to undermine unions because we have the only organizations in the United States that are capable of addressing inequality at the place where most Americans spend their time, which is the workplace. Um, I'm going to skip over that. So, uh, you know, and uh, what, so what, the other piece though is, you know, while the media constantly talks about these unfunded liabilities of public pension funds, Wall Street is making enormous amounts of profits from our pensions. Public pensions pay out $10 billion annually in fees to Wall Street, and yet returns consistently trail the market. And from 2010 to 2015, UC's risky investment model for the DV plan uh, cost them nearly $6 billion. That's hedge funds, private equity, real estate, trying to pick stocks when every single peer-reviewed study in the history of investment management has shown a large investor can, is incapable of picking stocks effectively. It's literally impossible. It's never been done unless you're Warren Buffett. He's the only person who's shown that you can actively manage a stock portfolio and actually beat the market. Nobody else can. Nobody else has been able to figure out how to do it. Uh, and uh, you know, it's you know, it's uh, Backer, you know, the same CIO who's making these decisions for our four three B plan and to hire fees. He's doing the same thing for our defined benefit plan, and then complaining, you know, in conjunction with the Napolitano, with the Napolitano administration, about the cost of our DV plan. So you know, they've increased significantly the amount of the DV plan invested in hedge funds and private equity and real estate and active management. It's now over a quarter of the portfolio, up from 0% 30 years ago. Uh, the top 10 hedge fund managers, uh, and over one third of the money from, for this industry comes from public pension funds. The top 10 hedge fund managers made over $10 billion in 2015, an average of over $1 billion. Compare that to the CEO of Verizon's salary, $18 million, which is obscene. They made over 50 times that amount. Paul Singer uh, um, made a $400 million in 2016. He manages over $250 million for the UC retirement plan. The returns are horrible. Uh, the fees are 60,000% higher than for ordinary stocks and bonds. He's the chairman of the Manhattan Institute, which has uh, propagated anti-pension research, anti-union research, filed amicus briefs against us in the Janice V. Asme case, work to undermine pensions in Puerto Rico and in Detroit. Uh, and this is who Napolitano and co are giving away the store to. I have a friend of mine who works as a private chef uh, for one of the, these guys, you know, and um, uh, the lifestyle that these people lead is just so unbelievably moral. Uh, I mean, he lives in this 
60 room mansion in upstate New York, and his entire family is deeply miserable. They come in every day, his kids come in every day having spent tens of thousands of dollars on designer clothes, day after day after day after day after day, bringing home bags and bags and bags of designer clothes, and that's all that they do. And this money is coming out of the pockets of people with 15, 20, $30,000 a year pensions. It's the massive, it's the most significant transfer of wealth in this country's history, and the media's silent about it. There's no reporting on it whatsoever. UC has uh, over $200 million invested in Blackstone Group, it's a private equity firm. Uh, you guys have heard about uh, Costa Hawkins uh, repeal. Who here has heard about uh, Prop 10? Uh, so Prop, so, uh, as I'm sure everybody here is dealing with the insane cost of living in California, uh, Prop 10, right now you can't, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but because I'm not from California, but you can't uh, put right control on properties that were built before 1973, I believe. Uh, yeah, the after 1973. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, <laughs> so there's a story coming out soon. So UC's, UC has money directly invested with Blackstone funds that have uh, made donations to the anti-Prop 10 campaign. So you have the, you, your pension is literally financing the campaign to defeat Prop 10. Literally, it's coming directly out of our retirement at UC to keep uh, uh, prohibitions on rent control in place. That's because Blackstone is the largest landlord in California. Uh, this is a guy, Schwartzman, who has made his money off of public pension funds. Uh, and he's made it also off of a tax code that rewards private equity uh, and hedge fund managers over everybody else. Uh, this has changed with the Trump tax plan. There's a lot of things that are in flux right now. They're trying to figure out how to exploit it in the most effective way possible. But up until the Trump tax plan, everybody else, if you made over a million dollars a year, you paid 39% of your income in taxes. Private equity and hedge funds paid 15%. Uh, so when Obama tried to get rid of the carried interest tax deduction, Schwarzman compared it to Hitler's invasion of Poland. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pete Peterson, who was Nixon's Secretary of Commerce, he just died a couple months ago, uh, he uh, was the co-founder of Blackstone. He was the rainmaker, and um, Schwarzman was the business end guy. He has used his Blackstone uh, billions to create the Peter G. Peterson Institute, uh, which is the main uh, network that is advocating cuts to veterans' benefits, to Social Security, and to Medicare. So again, what you have is, is we've literally been financing our own enemies, people attacking the foundations of what distinguishes post-1945 America from pre-1945 America, uh, and that's coming as a result of our pensions making these disastrous investment decisions. These are the top 20 uh, largest donors in the 2016 elections. So if you look at it, it's a hedge fund. Uh, Renaissance Technologies was the largest donor to both Hillary and to Trump. Uh, uh, hedge fund, hedge fund, hedge fund, financial conglomerate, hedge fund, two more financial conglomerates, a real estate lobby group, a bank, a hedge fund, another hedge fund down, private equity firm down there, that's Blackstone right there, hedge fund, another hedge fund, another hedge fund. Uh, there's no discussion of this. There's no discussion in our political economy about the, how these companies that are entirely dependent on public money and a tax code that is completely out of whack have really completely bought our democracy. There's no discussion of it. So poor investment returns and high fees, they reduce the funding levels of pensions and they increase contributions from states and municip municipalities. And then they high, the higher costs bolster the case of anti-pension advocates for cuts to pensions. So Jerry Brown, if you see it just pursued the same investment model that Warren Buffett advocates, which is you put 70% in the stock market and 30% in the bond market, pay as little fees as possible, and just leave it be. And then if you hadn't had these accounting rules changes, UC's pension plan would, have, like I said, have billions of dollars more in the portfolio. 
there'd be a much less stronger case to undermine our pensions, to, uh, there'd be less unfunded liabilities, and there'd be more, uh, there'd be less of an ability to bolster the case for moving us into a 401k plan for creating savings choice. So again, it's what you see is you, the people managing the investments for public pension funds, you know, it's like Backer is the highest paid employee of the university, he makes $700,000 a year. And he's using the money that he gets, you know, out of the pension to undermine public pension funds uh, to move us all into a 401k plan. And that's really because of this mass political effort to undermine the power of labor unions. So, you know, and it's also, let's be clear, there's like significant, you know, financial incentives for people to pursue investing in uh, private equity and hedge funds. You know, if you, it's not your money, it's other people's money. Uh, so, you know, there's numerous instances where politicians and pension trustees have received campaign contributions and bribes for giving business to favor private equity and hedge fund firms, you know, because the fees are so high, uh, you know, there's a big incentive. And there's been significant scandals all around, you know. Calper is a perfect kind of example here, you know, so uh, the CEO of Apollo, uh, uh, Leon Black, his cronies bribed you know, two uh, trustees, uh, well, a former trustee and then a, a current trustee at the time, and then the CEO of CalPERS. Uh, you know, these two guys, you know, they died in the middle of trials under kind of suspicious circumstances. One of them was murdered. Uh, and then uh, uh, the former CEO of CalPERS is in prison, and this guy's worth over $6 billion. Um, so how are we fighting back? So, you know, the first thing is, you know, we, we you know, it's, it's a two-track campaign, you know, we need to defend the political, we need to defend the DB plan, you know, because ultimately it's about our benefits. The way it's being managed, we need to be clear, the fees are ridiculous, the decisions they're making are ridiculous, but the underlying idea of a defined benefit pension plan, that is the exclusive way that we can have a secure retirement. Uh, and so we need to talk about fidelity in particular, and we need to talk about the significant conflicts of interest. You know, one of the things that, you know, I, uh, I talk a great deal with a research director at uh, Ask Me 3299, and one of the things that we've been trying to suss out is, you know, how much coordination is there between uh, the regents and, and the president's office? You know, because it's like, does Kiefer, is Kiefer really like an acting out Fidelity's interests, you know, <laughs> on the board of regents to Napolitano? How closely are they coordinating? It turns out, now that I have her schedule, I mean, these Kiefer and Napolitano, they talk three, four times a week. There's extensive coordination between the chair of the regions and the president's office. So we can be extremely confident that he is intimately aware of the administration's bargaining practices, that the administration is extremely, um, is refusing to move on any issue related to, you know, it's like, as, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I understand, they've said, we're not going to come to a tentative agreement on any economic issue until you guys agree to the opt-out. So there hasn't been any movement at the bargaining table for a year because the administration is refusing to move on this extremely basic issue that, again, no union in their right mind would agree to this. So it's like, it, you know, I, it, we get that, like, you know, Paul is from Arizona, but she didn't even try this shit in Arizona. You know, excuse me. You know, she didn't, when she was governor of Arizona, she never tried this. When she was secretary of Homeland Security, she never tried to eliminate federal workers' pensions, you know, at, at DHS. Never. In fact, you know, I mean, she was reason, I mean, at, when she was secretary of uh, Homeland Security, it was the largest, there was the largest organizing victory uh, of the entire Obama administration, where the, uh, the federal workers' union organized 40,000 TSA agents. So, uh, to me, it's clear that there is some things going on behind the corner because this is a person who historically didn't have an instinctive hatred of unions. Uh, something's happening where the power elite in California are, are afraid of the power of the labor movement here and they're organizing to undermine us. And you know, people are paying attention, you know, I mean, less to us, you know, but uh, the Koch brothers in terms of uh, their uh, efforts to get people to drop out of unions now that Janice V. Ask Me uh, has happened, Ask Me 3299 is one of the first unions that they have targeted. Uh, so it's clear, you know, that you see it's the driver of, of the university's economy. 
Uh, and uh, there's a lot of money at stake uh, to crushing unions here. 